In early 2019, astronomers found themselves presented with a rare opportunity. The All-Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae, or Assassin, run by the robotic Las Cumbres Observatory, had flagged something special. An increase in brightness around the supermassive black hole at the centre of a distant galaxy. Things in the universe change brightness all the time, but this detection looked like the telltale signs of the start of a tidal disruption event the destruction of a star by the gravity of a black hole. But before we go any further, please consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon so you don't miss future videos. The idea of tidal disruption events, or TDEs, is nothing new. They were first theorised back in the 70s, the early days of black hole theoretical astrophysics. It took until the 1990s, when astronomers explored archival observations from the ROSAT survey, to find evidence of this short-lived or transient event. The idea behind a tidal disruption event is quite simple. It's a fight between the gravitational pull from a black hole and the star's own gravity. The star's own gravity is the easiest to understand. The star is massive and gravity from all of that mass pulls inwards to try and crush the star. It's supported by the nuclear fusion reactions within, but that's what pulls inwards and holds the star together. But let's introduce a nearby black hole. Black holes are massive, and in this case, we're going to be talking about supermassive black holes. For some context, the supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy is about 2 million times as massive as our Sun. With that black hole in place, there's now a gravitational attraction between our star and our black hole. But that attractive force isn't constant. You see, the force you feel from gravity varies with distance. Closer to the black hole, the pull of gravity is stronger. Further away from the black hole, that pull is weaker. This can cause a problem for a star if it gets too close to a black hole, because stars are three-dimensional, they have a volume, and that volume is actually quite large. As the star gets closer to the black hole, the side of the star that's closer feels a stronger pull from gravity than the far side of the star. As the distance between the star and the black hole gets smaller and smaller, the force of gravity climbs, and so does that difference between the near and the far sides. Eventually, the star crosses a tipping point, the tidal disruption radius. This is the point where the black hole wins, where the force trying to rip the star apart overwhelms the star's own gravity. When this happens, the star is ripped apart, debris being scattered across a vast region of space around the supermassive black hole. Roughly half of the disrupted star has enough energy to escape the black hole's grasp, flying off into the surrounding space to cool and perhaps one day form new stars. The other half? Well, its journey provides one of the most exciting laboratories in astrophysics. Something you've got to understand about astronomy is that speed and time are relative terms. Most things do not happen on human timescales. For astronomers, the 100,000 year lifetime of a massive star is considered fast. Solar systems take millions of years to form, galaxies evolve on the scale of billions of years, and red dwarf stars being born today will have lifetimes longer than the current age of the universe. By comparison, what we're about to talk about happens on the order of months to years. In astronomical terms, it's a blink of an eye. Over the course of a few months, the half of the obliterated star that is still bound to the black hole's gravity will start to fall back onto the black hole. As it falls back in, it will form an accretion disk, initially elongated, but over time it will circularise. This is the thin disk of material rotating around the black hole, because angular momentum is conserved. In this disk, gas will rub up against each other, heating up due to friction, getting so incredibly hot that it emits X-ray light, releasing energy and letting this gas fall inwards onto the black hole. Eventually, that gas is lost beyond the event horizon, the point where not even light can escape. That whole process of falling back in and becoming a roughly circular accretion disk happens so quickly the astronomers have to rush to get as many observations as they possibly can, with as many telescopes as possible, at as many different wavelengths as possible. But because it's so fast, we get something rarely seen in astronomy. We get to see the whole process. 
not just snapshots. By their very nature, tidal disruption events are incredibly dynamic, involving so many different physical processes, gravity, fluid phenomena, radiative cooling, dynamical friction, all things that astrophysicists want to know more about. Tidal disruption events give us the opportunity to study these effects in real time, in a way we normally only get with simulations. Despite this, we still have a lot to learn about these events. We haven't observed that many of them, and those that we have, well, they have some rather significant tensions with the theory, namely that they seem to make disks that are too big, and that the tidal disruption events we detect in visible light don't seem to be that bright in X-ray emission, which we would expect. What's going on there is anyone's guess. They are very much still open questions. But they're questions that we may well get answers to in the next few decades. By far the biggest issue we have with observing tidal disruption events is finding them and getting those observations, particularly if we can find them while they're still rising to their peak brightness like we managed with Assassin 19 BT. That process of detection is going to get easier. There's a number of survey telescopes coming online in the next few years, in particular the Vera Rubin Observatory, which will be surveying the sky once every three nights. It should be able to detect that increase in brightness before the TDE reaches its peak. With new telescopes coming online and the massive improvements to computational power, it's a really exciting time to be in astronomy. There's so much we still don't know about space. I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, why not drop a like and send a good signal to the algorithm, or even better, share it with a friend. I mentioned that there's a load of new telescopes coming online soon, and they're going to be producing some insane amounts of data that's going to need to be processed and analysed. That analysis code is done using computer code. It's vital to how an astrophysicist gets their work done. I made a recent video all about it, so I'd highly recommend you check that out. It'll be on screen now. If you're new around here and want to chat with some other space nerds, then come join our community discord at the link in the description. And all that leaves me to say is thank you very much for watching this video all the way to the end, and I'll see you in the next one.